morning. This is a joint meeting of the Senate Health and Welfare and House Health Care Committees. And we're going to be listing this morning for a testimony from the uh, Accountable Care Organization for the State, One Care. Um, so before we begin, we'll, we're going to go around this table and have everyone introduce themselves for folks. And then after that, we'll uh, have a quick introduction to the meeting and then introduce our guests. So I am Senator Jenny Lyons. I chair of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Representative Bill Lippert, chair of the House Health Care Committee. So why don't we start over here? Representative Brian Schmidt, uh, Orleans One. Uh, I'm a, a member of the Health Care Committee in the House. I'm Representative William Page, of Orleans Two, and I'm a member of the Health Care Committee. Peter Reed, I'm from Bray Street, and uh, I'm part of the Health Care Committee. Laurie Cornis, Lincoln, Bristol, Moncton, and Starksboro House Health Care. Corey Houghton, Edwards Junction House Health Care. Ann Donahue, Northfield, and Berlin House Health Care. I'm Rich Westman. I'm the senator from the Royal. Debbie Ingram, senator from Chittenden County. Ann Cummings, senator from Washington. I'm Dick McCormick. I represent the Windsor County District. I'm Lucy Rogers, representative from Waterville. Terrific. Um, thank, thank you uh, all for being here. This morning, we have a, a terrific opportunity to hear from One Care, and, and then we'll continue testimony tomorrow so we get some of the picture today and I know that uh, we'll be hearing about the budget and uh, financial I issues um, so that will be today and then tomorrow we'll hear more about uh, the quality metrics and measurement you know measurements for determining quality improvement and other areas so just just contextually I think we're, we're have been some significant concerns about one care uh, some of which have been slightly negative. Our goal is to listen to information, to gather as much as we can, and then to make any decisions that need to be made uh, without prejudice. And that is the job of the legislature. We, um, and we'll continue to do that. The One Care, uh, for some of us, One Care is critically important for ensuring the stability and longevity of our community hospitals as well as having those hospitals link some of the acute care link with our community services. So as we go through this um, and today and tomorrow, we'll ensure ourselves that we're listening for those um, important attributes. Uh, we know that uh, One Cares is part of the whole system. Uh, we know that, and I see folks from the hospitals, uh, Greenbound Care Board, the administration, DIVA, our community, DAs and SSAs, and they're all so critically important for patient care in this state. So that, that's all I want to say, and I'll turn it over to Representative Weber. Uh, thank you. I simply say that I think um, we, both of our, each of our committees has um, spent some time trying to understand the context in which one care uh, has come into being uh, in terms of the all payer model. Uh, and the uh, health reform efforts through the, through the all-payer model agreement. I think there's been a great deal of confusion at times, uh, partly because of the language that we've used, that uh, all-payer model and the accountable care organization is an important part of payment reform, and, uh, but not, it's not the financing reform that has been confused by the language of single payer and then moving to an all payer model for payment reform. And I think it's been important for us to all understand uh, that we've had many initiatives over the past number of years uh, in Vermont around healthcare. This is a payment reform initiative and not a financing reform initiative. Uh, also, to say that uh, a few years ago we put into place. Um, uh, regulatory oversight through the Green Mountain Care Board of accountable care organizations that had not been in place previously. And I think part of what our job is at this point as well to hear and evaluate whether there's further 
uh, changes that need to be made in terms of uh, regulation uh, as, we, as we move forward. This is, as I've said to our committee, this is not the, we're going to hear from one care today and tomorrow. We decide to do it jointly, rather, so we all have heard the same information. But this is not the only testimony that either of our committees will be taking. We'll be hearing from other witnesses as well. But we want to give uh, one care the opportunity to put their information before both of our committees today. So with that. So, okay. welcome. So we have uh, two members of the uh, one care leadership and we will ask you to introduce yourselves for the record and then uh, offer your testimony. I know that you have handouts uh, for the committee. It's also on our web pages with the House and the Senate, so accessible information. And I think we're going to try to balance presentation and questions. We have, uh, there are, I'm sure there are questions uh, along the way, but uh, we're going to be meeting again tomorrow, so some questions, if it's a question that could be helped till tomorrow, that might be helpful to get the presentation in front of us today. Uh, let's try to think in terms of that, uh, but we don't want to preclude the possibility of clarifying any other questions. So. Okay, so for the record, my name is Vicki Lohner, I'm the CEO of OneCare. I think I am well known to many of you on the committee. I've had a few testimonies in the last so I'd like to use a little bit of time to let my colleague Tom Boris, who is the Senior Director of Finance, tell you a little bit about himself and his background before I commence into my portion of the presentation. Great. Thanks, Becky. Uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so my name is Tom Boris, Senior Director of Finance and Payment Reform for One Care. We want to move a little closer to the mic. Yeah, and, and let me ask you, if folks find that you're not being able to hear, would you just let us signal and we'll try to get either members or the witnesses to uh, get the microphones closer because these these both record and broadcast. So I've been with One Care Vermont for nearly three years. I've been quite a journey there, an experience for me. Prior to coming to One Care Vermont, I worked in the designated agency system for nearly 12 years, uh, the mental health substance use disorder side of the, of the business. and. Really, when I um, contemplated a career change coming into One Care, it was an opportunity to take some of the payment reform ideas we had on a more micro level and bring it to a macro stage. So it's really exciting about the opportunity to come here and just work and move it forward. And uh, I think that we've come a long way, and I'm really excited to share our story. Thank you. Great. So, today, as Representative Lumber and Senator Lyons said, we're going to focus more about um, One Care Vermont and kind of the governance structure as it stands and dig a little bit deeper into the finance portion of the presentation. And then tomorrow we hope to really cover a lot of the clinical and preventative health programs as well um, as our quality metrics. And we'll have members of our team available tomorrow to cover that portion of the presentation. So with that, I'm going to try to maneuver both this microphone and the clicker. So if you'll bear with me for a little bit, I thought it would be helpful just to go back and talk a little bit about what an ACO is to provide some context um, for the conversation. So it's really important to stress that an ACO is a legal entity. Um, and the reason why we're held together is we had providers that can actually share resources together without losing autonomy and without having to formally merge into another organization. When these providers come together, they take accountability for both the quality and the cost for the defined population. ACOs um, are not new, and in fact, they're growing fairly rapidly. If you look throughout the country right now, there are about 43 million individuals who are covered under an ACO um, construct, and about 20% of the Medicare population is actually covered through an ACO. This is the way that the Medicare program is moving is the direction of ACOs and other value-based payment mechanisms. So in terms of Vermont being different in that aspect, this is the way that the whole country is moving in terms of, of ACOs. The waiver is, of course, um, very unique in Vermont. So if I could just 
call out when, you know, runners are coming together and thinking about forming an ACO, what are the things that they view that they need to have in place in order to be successful? So I found a really um, helpful slide that came from the American Academy of Family Physicians, and they suggested that there's really eight essential elements to becoming successful as an ACO. And of course, in traditional um, Vermont fashion, I've adapted it slightly to meet our needs. So, so in terms of uh, population scale, we have a lot of conversations about that because the all payer model requires us to have it and meet certain scale targets as a state. Um, and of course, the ACO plays a major role in meeting those scale targets. Because remember, this is voluntary. So members that join the ACO voluntarily do so, and insurance companies that contract with ACOs voluntarily do so. So that's an important thing to remember when you're thinking about um, having population and scale in a voluntary system as it stands right now. You have to make it so it seems like something that both providers and the insurance companies see value. That's, that's our job, is to show the value of entering into this kind of arrangement together. At its core, what an ACO does is it really provides that legal mechanism to be able to connect providers together, to be able to share resources, to not run afoul of government um, anti-kickback or stark laws, antitrust laws. So it provides the kind of safe harbor to be able to do that. We can't do any of this, and you all know this, building out from the blueprint reforms without primary care. We have a lot of discussions about the importance of primary care. We know that there's an access problem in Vermont, and I think um, throughout the country there's access with primary care. So really what we spent the last couple years doing when we're building our programs is to think about primary care as foundational. And you'll see later on in the presentation when we look at the investment streams, the preponderance of those investments have gone to primary care to stabilize that, to try to stabilize those providers that are in there. Can't say that we've been totally successful, but you, you gotta start somewhere. Best practices is really important to this. Um, Evidence-based practices um, to make sure that all of our providers, and sometimes this is viewed as a bad word, but really have standardization so that individuals can have the same care experience regardless of where they seek care. And I think that's really important for people to have a similar experience with their health care. And that's really the ultimate goal and to have good outcomes. We're a very um, high value, high quality state, and there's always room for improvement, I believe. Financial incentives, Tom's gonna talk a lot about that. He really um, is the brains, um, along with some really talented staff and our provider network, we're thinking about what are the financial incentives and what are the payment reform mechanisms that need to come into place to really enable the the clinical and delivery system change that needs to happen. I think what we've seen in the past under fee for service is that the system doesn't provide the right incentives for providers to really be able to practice the way that they want to practice or the way that they were trained to practice. So we're trying to figure out um, the payment mechanisms to enable them to do that. There's always administrative capabilities that are needed when you think about this. We had um, many waivers that were allowed under the all-payer model, and that requires a lot of compliance and oversight to make sure that um, we are really running those programs to the way that the federal and state government and the payers expect us to. As well as thinking about risk mitigation plans, reinsurance plans for providers who have agreed to take on some fairly significant risk in the program um, and to make sure that we're financially solvent in the process. And data analysis is a really big component of it, both at an individual level as well as a population.
population level. When you think about electronic medical records, that really enables a provider to see what's in their four walls of their healthcare system. And maybe they have some connections with other, you know, tertiary medical systems or with their, their local home health. But this provides them the data analysis that we're providing them. Although there is a lag because it's it's claims data, but it does allow them to see um, more holistically the care that is happening with a particular patient and a family. So why did the federal government do this? Why did Vermont look at an ACO as the approach for the all care model? I think there's a lot of good reasons for that. Obviously, I wasn't there when the all care model agreement got signed, and I certainly wasn't there in the Obama administration when they decided on ACOs. But if I look back to um, the benefits that is provided by having the ACO be the mechanism, there's multiple um, positive points in that, in that this is really provider-led reform. So you're asking the delivery system to provide you information about what they think is best practices in terms of them really being able to provide the best quality care they can for the patients and what do they need both clinically and financially in order to succeed in this in this new world that is moving quickly. You can't really hide under a rock anymore with payment reform. It's it's coming um, and it's here to stay. So this is really important that they are, if you will, in charge of their own destiny with this. The ability to share data across multiple providers is really important so that if your uh, individual patient say I'm needing some care coordination services to have a shared platform that all my providers can see um, what my needs are, what I'm looking for, what my goals are, and everybody have access to the same common information without having to go back to the individual and asking them by multiple providers. I think we've all experienced that, right, with your healthcare system that you go to your primary care doctor, he asks you a similar question, then your specialist might ask you, then your home health provider. So really not having to repeatedly tell that story. And we all know as historians, when you have an illness, Sometimes your recognition or remembrance of what happened in the events might not be as reliable as things go on. So this is a, a way to really capture that information and share it. Are you going to talk about access to electronic records and information for folks who are um, within the ACO, including primary care? I can. Okay. Yeah, we can talk about that today or tomorrow, right. wherever. Okay. We have a data management yep. discussion tomorrow, so. Good. I think I talked earlier about really a forum to share best practices, and if you look at a lot of the quality measures that are required under the all payer model, it really requires you to put in place some best practices in order to meet those, those quality metrics. They're not easy ones. Um, we were doing really well on a lot of the quality metrics, so we decided to select ones that were harder and that we weren't doing so well at. And I think that was the right move to make, although it will take some more time to, to move the dial on those measures. We, we talked earlier about it's really also a mechanism to be able to share risk across multiple systems of care so that some of your smaller critical access to hospitals might not be able to bear this level of downside financial risk. In totality, we're looking at if we had the worst year ever, um, it would be about $44 million worth of financial payback that the ACO would have to provide to all the payers that has contracts with. On the positive side, that could mean if we had a really good year, that would be in $44 million of, of upside for beating our budget. So 
it's fairly significant risk that's able to be pooled across a large um, set of providers. And then in terms of enabling new partnerships and collaborations, that's really not having to merge with another organization and being able to maintain your independence and at the same time being able to share some resources collectively with other members of the healthcare system. This really is striving for a unified care model, so regardless of your payer or your insurance company, that um, patients have access to the same to the same care experience. And you know, that's definitely a long-term goal. You're gonna have some misses along the way, but that's the vision. The opportunity to have some payment reforms and have payment structures in place that that makes sense and allow providers to deliver the care that they want to deliver is an, is an important aspect. I think Ian Abacus, who is the director of payment reform yesterday in health care, talked a little bit about the MAC or MIPS reward. So it can either be a reward or a penalty. So for those providers that are participating under an ACO model, they qualify as an advanced payment um, and have a 5% bump to their claims for Medicare at the end of the year. So that's a significant advantage for primary care practitioners that participate in this model. And then I think you all know about the benefit enhancements that really um, seek to make sense of the way care really needs to be delivered in that um, access to post-discharge home visits, even if you don't have a skilled need, like you don't need to have a dressing change, you don't need to have an IV, but maybe you need somebody to talk to you about your four medications that you received and when you need to take them, and do that in a time and space where you actually have the headspace to have that conversation. We all know what it's like to be hospitalized, um, have a new event happen, and then somebody quickly tell you on your way out the door, all the repetitive things that you need to do um, while you're still recovering. I think that you all have seen this slide before, but when I talk about one care being provider-led, I think it's important to see um, how decisions are made through the ACO. We have a board of managers, so it's to the left of the screen, that currently right now, it's a pretty large board, it's 20 members. Um, so any of you who've been on boards, which I'm sure y'all have, know that that's a, that's a large board to um, get to consensus on good things. We have uh, members of the federally qualified health centers representing our board, independent physicians. We have all sorts of hospital systems on our board. In terms of community agencies, who that represents, we have members from our designated mental health agency, members from our home health agencies, and members from our skilled nursing um, and long-term care. And then, really importantly, we also have consumers that represent the insurance um, that we have contracts with. So currently, we have um, a consumer that represents Medicare, one that represents Medicaid, um, and um, one that represents our commercial insurance. So three consumers on that. That's our board, that's where all decisions are made, final decisions are made. If you turn to the right, we also have various committees that really are the individuals that bring up various recommendations to the board of managers to be able to make some final decisions. And we have a population health strategy committee, which is fairly diverse. We have 20 members on that committee right now. Of uh, note, the commissioner for the Vermont Department of Health is on that. We have Dr. Brina Holmes, who works um, in maternal and child development, I believe, from the health department, as well as multiple providers from across the care system. We have our finance committee, which Tom um, is intimately involved in, and that really represents finance leaders from across the states and the hospitals to really evaluate some of these programs and structures that we're putting in place and making sure that it makes sense for their communities. 
have a fairly robust patient and family advisory committee. Uh, it was a requirement under Medicare that you have a consumer advisory board. This um, board really came together and they renamed themselves. They've really taken an active role in looking at some of our care coordination platforms and providing some recommendations. We had some, we were developing some core messages for One Care. So when people ask what is One Care, what do they do, we could have some common language around that. And they were really um, vital in that conversation to say, if you said that to me, that wouldn't make any sense. Like that's got way too much jargon in it. So really getting that feedback from um, individuals who aren't deeply entrenched in the healthcare system like some of us are was really important. Uh, Clinical and Quality Advisory Committee, this is a big group of people, so I think there's over 40 individuals on this committee, and I am glad I don't have to chair that committee. <laughs> it's, uh, providers, frontline providers from around the state that are really talking about what should our clinical priorities be, looking at the data, making some decisions on what to focus on, because there's always going to be something that we should be doing or something we should focus on, and um, they help us to really think about what are the four or five things that are important for us, at least in the, in the next year, and really feeding that information up. We have a pediatric subcommittee, because as we all know, um, kids and their families um, have very different needs and dynamics, and it's important to get some perspective of if you're developing a care model, does it work for um, kids and adults as well? So I think we've seen that. If you don't, you need to make some modifications and processes. And then our capital communities for health, um, those are throughout the state, and those are really grassroots organizations that uh, participate with the ACO as well. Um, as their local communities to think about the needs that they had. And they really helped to inform a lot of our committees and priorities. So a lot of work goes on and a lot of um, people are brought to the table before we finally get to some decisions um, as the ACO. So this process starts fairly early on so that each year um, and as things arise, we can get to some consensus. So before we move to the next slide, I'm just, I want to pause here and see if there are any questions around the table regarding any of this, the governance structure, the decision-making process. Go ahead. Uh, is there any significance to the uh, use of the word manager rather than directors? The board of managers? It's because of our um, corporate structure and that we're a limited liability um, organization, so we have a board of managers. Any other questions? Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. They may be things you're going to answer later. One is uh, the risk management and how decisions are made about how to share the risk, where those decisions are made, and then obviously the, the board is going to have to vote on some of those that, right? So um, is it the finance committee that brings forward the proposals for shared risk? How does that? So is that something you're going to talk about later? Or do you want to just give a quick answer now? Yeah. 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 yeah, it's a great question. So um, really just two parts. The first and what dictates the risk is the upstream contracts that we have with a payer partner. So we enter into a contract with the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, for example, and that comes with a, a risk percentage, essentially. The first step is the board decides what's acceptable at that macro level for the ACO to absorb. So that's one part of the equation. Then, and perhaps more complicated, is how we share that risk within our network of providers. And uh, I'd say there's no um, one-size-fits-all approach. We have a diverse state. Each community is a little bit different. Uh, when we first started uh, entering into two-sided risk contracts, we had a series of meetings with our uh, basically hospital CFOs, those we, that were going to be taking the risk in the initial years of our programs and work, and decided upon a methodology that uh, we believed 
place the right financial incentives in place. And when you get into the weeds a little bit, if you share risk in a, in a certain way, it might actually incentivize behaviors that we don't think are appropriate for the long, well, the benefit of our monitors. For example, um, referring out. If you can avoid risk by referring out of your community, we think that's generally a bad thing. Uh, so we designed a risk model that relies on the hospitals to help get this off the ground as the, as the main risk-bearing entities and share that risk on a community basis. So each community health service area in our state has its own measurement of their performance and then that hospital is uh, the risk-bearing entity on behalf of that community. And I will say as we move into the future, it's a topic we discuss often at Finance Committee and at the full board in terms of is what we have in place today the right thing as we move forward? And, and I think there's a, a, a lot of conversations saying we should evolve as We evolve as an organization. How should we evolve our risk sharing model to make sure that it aligns with our goals? Does that answer your question? It, it does. And so as, as a new hospital might come in to the, to the ACO, um, what, what risk model are they presented with? So are they, uh, is it, something that is uh, prohibitive and how, how, how does that all sugar sure. off? Can, can, can I, and can I just say something more, just something as basic as like when we're talking about two-sided risk, what that, what that really means so that people are clear, clear <coughs> yeah, understanding of that. Um, so the, generally the way an ACO uh, contract works is you agree at the beginning of the year on a cost to take care of the population. You have 20,000 lives, you say, we think it's going to take, say, $100 million to take care of these particular patients. At the end of the year, it will be something other than $100 million, unless the actuaries are dead on it. That's unlikely. The risk corridor sets an upper and lower bound to how much reconciliation activity there is in the end. So that is to say, if it costs $101 million to actually take care of these people, the providers went over. They spent too much to take care of the population. They owe the million dollars back to the payer. Inversely, if it was ended up being $99 million, they would be entitled to shared savings. They agreed, we'll take care of the population for $100 million. Here's your million dollars at the end. To make, really to enable decision making, to say, yeah, I'll go in and do this program, there are these boundaries that say, the most you'll ever get or the most you'll ever have to pay is some percentage of that total cost of care, that $100 million, that example. We enter into a, a program at the ACO level. One Care Vermont signs a contract with Blue, Shield, Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont. That comes with a total number, let's say it's $5 million. The challenge that I think the question uh, asks is how do we decide who in the One Care Vermont network pays that if we owe it back or who gets it if we have a really good year? And internally within our network, we can do it in a number of different ways. We've really relied on the hospitals to step up and take the risk in the, in the first couple of years of this model. But as I said before, I think we need to think more broadly about how we evolve that to continue to align with the goals as we move So and to, to ask kind of a strange question, but um, for me not strange, um, what, what role, if any, does net patient revenue pay within, the, so each hospital has its own net patient revenue, which may be outside of the money that we're talking about within the ACO. So what role does that pay, play? Yep, you're asking a, a very good question. So again, around the incentives, the ACO models generally revolve around primary care. There are plenty of ACOs in this country that are just primary care providers, and they say, we think we can um, do our work a little bit differently as a primary care provider and manage the spend at another hospital or a different acute care setting. We've taken that approach and implemented, implemented it within our network. So we look at the patients that attribute to our programs and where their primary care relationship is. If that primary care relationship happens to be in Chittenden County, then the hospital for Chittenden County, UVM Medical Center, is the financial risk-bearing entity. If that person attributes to a provider in Windsor, then Mount Scutton is the risk-bearing entity. What that means is that each community is locally accountable for their lives, the lives that attribute and live in their community. <coughs> what it also means is that Mount Scutney Hospital is, has the financial risk and benefit as well 
for wherever that person receives their care. That varies widely across our network. Mount Scutney, as a small critical access hospital, refers a lot more care out than a UVM Medical Center, which just has more services available to its patients. So there is a variation within our risk sharing model of how much of the care each community or hospital delivers and how much risk they have. That's, that's a, a really hot topic within our network. Does that still make sense? It does put in place the local accountability. Mount Scutney is responsible for the Windsor lives. That feels right in some ways. But what might not feel perfectly fair to the Mount Scutney um, board or finance leadership is that a lot of the care they refer out to either Dartmouth or UVM Medical Center, they're still at risk for that. And there's fair arguments for both sides of that does make sense and then somebody can argue, well, you lose some control. And so you're working on that. We are working on that, yes. And so we would like to, at some point, we may want to dive further into this. Hi. Um, so you, am I correct in saying each health service area has its own measurement of performance correct. and risk? In the reconciliation process, if the health service area is below performance and therefore owes the payer, is any of that risk in any way getting shifted onto other health service areas? Another really good question. Um, so when we sign up at the macro level as one care per month, it comes with that, that larger number, let's say it's $5 million of risk. We try to divide it up to say each community has a portion of that. But the, the upstream program has no limit up to the macro level. So we take, let's say it's a 5% risk corridor. We apply a 5% risk corridor to each community's performance for their life. So it does scale down with each community. But the problem is um, any one community technically, let's say all communities except for one are right on the target and one of them has a really bad year. That one community could drive the full five million with the payer upstream. So we have a, a pooling mechanism that comes in play if any one community has a really bad year or a really good year, once they get to that percentage that we've applied to them, we call that the maximum risk limit, any amount above that is cross-covered by the other communities. I think of it as, for those familiar with reinsurance, as a network-funded reinsurance model. If you get, if you have a bad enough year, well, typically a reinsurance, if you buy reinsurance, it would kick in and protect you from that point forward. You gotta pay for it. It's a premium you pay for. Within a network like ours, we can cross cover each other. One hospital community has a bad year, the others will share to protect beyond that point. Okay. Will we be seeing tomorrow or later today in the presentation where all of this has played out over the last couple of years? Or is the data not available yet? So where things are falling? We, we do, have, it's not in the, in the deck today. Um, we do have some information, uh, 2018 is a concluded year, so there's uh, results there. I can certainly speak to it at a high level. Uh, 2019 is still unfolding, even though we're into 2020 now. Uh, it takes another probably five or six months of claims run out to have a final measurement of everyone's performance. Uh, but at a, at a high level, I can speak to 2018 as being, particularly for Medicare, a very positive year. Uh, all, all HSAs are in shared savings, which is a great start uh, to the program. Uh, Medicaid was a, a favorable year as well. Um, there's a, there's a two-part um, component to the Medicaid program. There's a fixed payment that is unreconciled. You can either think of it as a salary. Either you live within it or you don't. And in the year that you don't, you could have earned more if you were service. You can argue if that's good or bad. But there's the fixed payment measurement. Generally what we're seeing is hospitals accepting a fixed payment have had really strong performance. We're seeing declines in uh, the type of services we'd like to see decline. It's a good thing. What we are seeing though is some increased spending outside of the fixed payments, and that's a little bit more complicated, but it can be good and bad if we're trading an ED visit, emergency department visit, for a home health visit, that's a good thing. So I'm happy to see fee-for-service increases outside um, but we're also seeing hospitals that aren't doing a fixed payment showing some increases as well, so that's something that, that's why payment reform is an important part of this, is it does change the thinking. Uh, and I certainly hope it continues to change the thinking. 
So for Medicaid, what we saw was we did owe some money back then in the year, but, it, but the performance out of the fixed payment was better than what we owed. So it's a net positive year for the program. Thank you. Just go ahead. You need the mic, yeah, so we can hear your question. Uh, either, either within the risk corridor or, or not, uh, does the insurers bearing some risk? <laughs> so, so if the, if the payment the cost, in the example you gave earlier, exceeds $105 million, uh, you mentioned that the other communities might pick up uh, some of that. Yeah. At, at some point, are, are, the, are the insurers also either taking on risk or benefiting if they if there's a lower yep good question so there's a couple ways um, one is if if our spend were to get out be outside of the risk order the payer takes on from that point forward so if we had a six percent overrun and we're limited to five that one percent above is fully the payer's responsibility same on the savings side so that's that's one way another is um, some programs have a risk sharing factor meaning that Within the risk order, so within the corridor, a factor might say for every dollar of shared savings we earn, we share that 50-50 with, with the payer. That's the type of arrangement we have in place with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, for example. So if we save a million dollars, we get 500000 for to reward the providers. Blue Cross gets 500000 as well to put back into their rate filing and benefit the, those who pay uh, premiums on the exchange. So that's another way in which the insurance uh, companies retain some, some risk and reward in the model. The last is at the beginning of the year when they enter into an agreement with us, they're agreeing to a, a preset price. And when you do that, there's inherent risk in it. Is it set correctly or not? And could something happen, an epidemic in the state in the year that really benefits that payer? Or maybe we just have a really good year and everyone's healthy, which would be awesome. But that, that's a risk that they also uh, should think about as well. And the inverse side of that is the stability that offers. If, I'm a, if I were a commercial payer, I would love this idea because it allows me to take a large amount of my spend and lock it in at the beginning of the year. That builds stability into their overall model. Medicaid tells us this all the time. That, there's a lot of value in setting this price up front. We know for all the lives that attribute to one care, it's going to cost X PM PM at the end of the year. That makes their budgeting a lot easier. That makes their forecasting a lot easier. It's really going from an hourly rate to a salary. When you have that salary, you know how much you're going to be paid. It's easier to do your planning. OK. Other questions? Good, thank you. This was a great discussion. Good. Thank you for all those questions, so I was able to catch my breath. <laughs> <laughs> I shall continue. Yeah. The next slide is really to just give a good visual of the journey that we've had since we started the all pair ACO model. Ina Backus, I think, has been to many of your committees prior to this discussion to talk about this, this six-year agreement that we had. With the first year, which was interestingly called year zero um, of, of the program, <laughs> I don't know. Year zero, that's, <laughs> that's, a, I, that's when you have an unbirthday. <laughs> it is really Alice in Wonderland-ish. <laughs> The recognition that moving to a value-based care system was going to take some time to set things up. And I might even argue that we should have had year zero times two right? um, to, to be able to really get this, because this is really large-scale reform. This isn't small-level reform. Luckily, um, our Medicaid partner stepped up and said, <laughs> We understand that in order to really develop and test a program, you need to be actively implementing all the components of it. So year zero was um, starting with Medicaid as um, the one commercial program 
And we had four uh, provider communities at that time, you can see as you move down to the map, that agreed to participate in how do you design a fixed payment? What does it feel like to get that fixed payment every month? Can we really reconcile it? Are there any bumps when you go to pay a claim in the process or determine eligibility with such a model? We also, in that year, piloted a, a program with them to remove prior authorizations for any um, individual that was attributed to the Medicaid program and seeing um, what that would do in order to really take away some of that administrative burden that the provider's office is faced when having to call the insurance company to ask basically for permission to do select procedures. And also um, the delays that it takes for the patient to be able to receive some care and doing that. So, we put in a rather robust system to be able to monitor what happens when you remove those prior authorizations. Do you have um, radical overutilization? All of a sudden, everybody's getting a um, CAT scan, or do you, because of the fixed payment, this is something you have to think about, do you have this like rationing or underuse of services? And that's something really important for us to monitor is both under and over utilization of, of services in this type of system. Will you at some point be giving us what the outcome of the results are of removal <coughs> prior off? I, yeah, I can absolutely bring that in. In the short, um, we have seen that uh, providers have not gone wild and, <laughs> and performed a bunch of services because of that. In fact, we're seeing as we measure in the Medicaid population that still has the prior authorization attached to it compared to the Medicaid population that's within the ACO, similar patterns of utilization. And that's what you want. That's what you want to be able to see. But we do monitor that monthly. We've developed an application in our system to be able to really drill down and we see any variances to try to understand why we're seeing them. Um, and to make sure that it's not changes in, in practice patterns. I think I've said it to your committees before, sometimes you think you say things. I don't really say that. We do that a lot these days. Um, it's if you're putting a provider under a budget that they have to live in, just like we have a budget for the year, it's really not um, advantageous for that provider to not provide preventative health services, routine services, because you're gonna be responsible for the total cost of care for that individual. And if you don't provide the necessary services, they can have a catastrophic event. That's gonna be way more costly to your budget than if you had the home health visit, if you um, had the appropriate screening up front. So this really, this type of system really does incentivize those preventative health, and there's a big focus on that. If you look at some of our measures that Sarah Berry, our Chief Operations Officer, will share tomorrow, it's really measuring what is the access link to primary care in the ACR population, and are we seeing that go up, or are we seeing that decline, because it's really foundational. And since it is foundational, I'm, no, go ahead, okay. but since it is foundational, then, uh, the measurements that you're making with uh, fee-for-service as compared with the uh, all-payer <coughs> per member per month. And um, over time, you should be able to measure the net patient revenue as compared with the shared savings within the system, right? So you mm -hmm. can get see a differential. Mm -hmm. and you can clarify my question for people. It helps, but so then, then as we look at expansion with each, within each of the service areas, we would expect to see primary care expansion. And that the, the, the funds available for each of uh, the hospitals, so let's so say there's an ex more net patient revenue, I'm, I'm sticking with that one because it seems to be important. If that goes up over time, then shouldn't that be invested in primary care? And what, if any, or 
community services, what, if any, um, directives and guidelines are in place to ensure that that happens rather than an expansion of acute specialized care? Not that we d dislike specialized care, but if the goal is prevention and primary care, then how is that, how is that happening, not just with a shared savings to stabilize the system, but with other money funds that are there as a result of this system? Am I being clear, or am I being obtuse? <laughs> I, I, I think I'm all. And when I get into the budget, I think we will show a little bit more about our investments in primary care, uh -huh. because they are at the center of the care model that we've developed in every ACL model, to be honest. Um, so I can talk about those, the funding there, and then really at the highest level, say that in an ACO type um, paradigm where you're agreeing for, uh, for that preset price at the beginning of the year, the model always rewards value. And it's a quality rewards. value. Right. So quality, make sure the yeah, word. Quality, quality, let's say it all is equal. Um, if you can deliver the care, not in an acute setting, but in a community-based setting that has a different price point, appropriate price point, the model rewards that. And if the whole state is really doing a value-based care model, there's no financial incentives anymore to increase capacity in acute care um, financially. If it's within the ACO, but Correct. I mean, yeah. but outside of the ACO, so the hospital making big bucks, right? So the, what, what incentive for investment in primary care or community care is there? And I guess you can't answer that question, but we well, need Well, maybe another, uh, let me see, I don't know, I'm sure I can follow up, but what yeah. relationship is there between what what's happening in the ACO attributed lives and the incentives there, what relationship is there at this point in the system for hospitals around their financial uh, performance outside of the ACO? And if they, if they show a high return, if they're showing increased net patient fees outside the ACO, mm -hmm. is there any relationship to what's happening within the ACO? Good. Thank you. Is that, I think that's part of what yeah, I think good. you're getting at. Yeah, I, I have a general answer to that, I think. That is, th this is an evolution, and for communities that really in all different payer product lines, and they're in the Medicaid program, in the Medicare program, in the Blue Cross program, they get a large enough portion of their business in a value-based model where that is the primary basis for their decisions. When they're making business decisions, it's in spirit of value-based care. Where we struggle a little bit more is a, pro a community is just in one program, for example. It ends up being a pretty small portion of their business, right. so they, yeah. they still are making decisions in spirit of their fee-for-service revenue, volume-based revenue, and have a little bit of activity in value-based care. That's what the all-payer model is, a test of scale. If you get everybody into this other paradigm, Everybody doing value-based care can be effective in managing cost and quality. I, I just wanted to follow. I wanted to follow up very briefly on the example of the prior authorization with Medicaid. It, it seems to me that um, that actually carries no benefit to primary care in reduction of administrative costs unless it goes across all the payers. Um, because they're still having to segment off. Okay, I don't need prior off for this. I do need for this. I do need differently for this. Um, so is the goal for something like that that it would be consistent for all of the involved payers, for all the attributed lives? Yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the benefits that an ACO offers is the ability to take the different, let's call it rules, that each payer has in play and try to align the provider experience downstream so that there's a more uniform business model, care model in play. And it's gonna take time to get there. We've had success in certain areas. We're demonstrating the effectiveness of prior off waiver with Medicaid in hope that it can be transferred to other programs. And who, where will that decision be made? So th that um, comes down to that contract 
between the ACO and the payer. So really, it becomes a negotiation between the ACO and the payer to whether or not um, that prior authorization is lifted. So what we've seen in the past is with Medicaid really as a test to see if you, because there's always this assumption, if you lift this prior authorization, then you're going to have a lot of changes in utilization patterns. Perhaps you're going to have some effect on quality of care. And so that really, you really need to take that out of the equation and use the data to inform that if you do this, this is going to be the outcome. And I think that's what we've been working with Medicaid and really refining that every single year of the program. I believe you for Medicaid testify in the first year that we thought it was going to be really easy to do this. <laughs> really, it was fairly operationally challenging to take away rules and logic that had been built into everybody's system for years and years and years. Okay. Go ahead. Um, to put into context the 250,000 Vermonters in 2020, if every single Vermonter could be in the ACO, was in the ACO, what's the number that that could be? I believe the denominator, and don't quote me directly on this, is around 500,000, or maybe a little over 500,000 is the denominator that they use for scale. And that is available on the Vermont Care Board website. I'd be happy to follow up and send you the actual number after testimony. So the waiver lasts until what year? 2022. 22. So then two more years after the 2020. Yes. And I believe that you, um, some of you saw yesterday in terms of where we're at right now in total. So all payers, Medicaid, Medicare, commercial, we're at about 48% and we need to be closer to 50%. So less far behind this year as we were in previous years and that's really because of the infusion that we've seen in the commercial business this year having Blue Cross Blue Shield in as a pair not just as for the QHP population but also their fully insured populations and their self-insured populations and there's another product that they had that's escaping me right now. Um, we also have a new contract with MVP this year for the qualified health plans. And the biggest deterrent with the number that we're, we're not hitting collectively as a state right now is around the Medicare. I think we're supposed to be upwards around 70% about this point in time. And, and we're, we're not at that number. And if you ask what the biggest deterrent is for providers entering into the Medicare program, it's risk financial risk. Mm -hmm. The risk is very high in the Medicare program. It's 5% in the spend on the populations. If you look at their average PMPM cost for Medicare beneficiaries, much higher than it is for Medicaid and the commercial programs. So all in total, we have about $44 million worth of risk, and the Medicare program alone is $26 million. So it's significant proportion. Of the overall risk. Go ahead. I have a comment and a question. Um, in my experience, um, when we're talking about utilization, the group the, of providers that um, I think least would be least likely to overutilize are actually the primary care provider community. Um, yesterday we were talking about um, the percentage of what kind of providers in, in the state, in the country, are very different from what we see in, in Europe, uh, with 25% primary and 75% specialty. What um, kind of conversations have you had with the community of providers that are specialists about this, you know, shifting from, because the specialty work, mm -hmm. excuse me, it is still, um, largely, if not completely, fee-for-service? So that's a really good question. And if you think about it, I'm not sure what the proportion is in Vermont, but a lot of the specialists are employed by the hospital systems. And when we put the hospitals under our capitation, it's every employee that 
furthers a claim that's actually under that capitated payment. So all their primary care um, revenue, all their specialty revenue, if they have imaging revenue, inpatient beds, certain um, medications that would be prescribed in the hospital. So the incentive is there for this, the specialist um, to be able to really work towards that value-based care and work collaboratively with their primary care partners in that. And then for the specialists outside of the hospital system that are fee-for-service, that's what we try to do with our clinical priorities and our value-based care is to think about what sort of programs or best practices do we need to put into place to really deliver um, on our overall goals for the program. And we tried really hard last year to put into place a, a, like a specialist program and we had funding available to it. And we found that in Vermont, at least, and even when we've talked to our partners outside of Vermont and other ACOs, it's really hard to put in place like one specialist program because you normally see bits and pieces like you see a little bit of ENT, a little bit of cardiology, a little bit, but it's not un uniform. So that's one of the, it's a great question, that's one of the things that we're really still kind of digging into to say what could be a program that could cut across all specialists because there's so many different type of specialists to be able to identify a common program or platform. Thank you. One other, uh, well I heard it from, this is third party knowledge, but I heard it from specialists that um, has really stuck with me in that if you have to make an appointment with a specialist, there's often a long waiting list, right? It takes time to get in. They, or at least what it's been conveyed to me, is that it's always preferred to make sure that the people who book with the specialist really need specialty care. And by investing in the primary care layer and making sure that you've really reached the top of the primary care license before somebody is referred to a specialist, that has system benefit. And that, that's one of the ways the whole system starts to work together is you really maximize your primary care. Hopefully that has some benefit and that the specialty care is more appropriate. Okay, I'm going to suggest that we move along just looking at the number of slides that are left and, and yeah. um, we will, we'll make it a stop in a little while for some more questions. We'll get to the bus stop. Okay, good, <laughs> thanks. Bus stop. Good stop. We're going to dig a lot deeper into this in day two, but I wanted to provide an overview when we think about what are the successful components of an ACO and what have been some of the directionally positive things that we've seen as, as an ACO over the last couple of years. So you've heard a lot about care coordination that's really foundational to our work. Starting this year in the second quarter, we're changing our payment methodology for the care coordination. Previously, we paid uh, infrastructure payment, essentially, so it was the same payment all the time based on attributed lives. What we're moving to since we're into year three of the program now is paying for engagement. So that's really paying for a relationship between the individual who is the lead on the care coordination and part of the care team and the patient. So we work really hard with um, our community of providers. I think um, our directors and COO um, spent months and months across the state last year uh, having forums to talk to how could this evolve, what would be some of the steps and safety nets we needed to put in place. And we're happy to say that we've seen a lot of movement in the care coordination program and that we have close to 4,000 individuals who are receiving, actively receiving care coordination. I think I've said this to this uh, committee before, but it doesn't mean that a care coordinator has called the key loaner and agreed to care coordination. That doesn't count. <laughs> That's not actually care coordination. That means that a care coordinator and the members of the team have met with me. We um, discussed what my mutual goals are. We've developed a plan of care together and we've initiated at least two parts of that plan going forward. So that's really actively having a new partnership between the care coordination team and the individual who's needing the services. 
So that's a fairly significant number. Sarah Barra will be showing you tomorrow, and I'll just give you a little preview today. When we had looked at individuals who have been under care coordination services for at least six months and compare them to those who are not receiving care coordination services, which is harder than you think, actually, because we, we've seen a remarkable amount of churn in our population. So keeping somebody consistently for six months has, has been challenging for us to monitor, but we've seen significant reduction, 33 reduction reduction in emergency room department used for our Medicare population. We've seen a similar reduction, although not as large, 13% in our Medicaid population. And I hope to have the VNAs in at some point to talk to you about the longitudinal care pilot that VNA initiated last year using some of our funding. You can also go to our website um, and watch the WCAX video that um, has a patient telling their story about the longitudinal care pilot and how it impacted them personally. But that's going to be spread statewide this year, so we're really excited to, to see that move forward. Can you, at some point uh, tomorrow, perhaps, can you talk about who's, who, who is prioritized for care coordination. Care coordination is not for every attributed life, is that? It's not for every attributed life, and I'll ask Sarah to go deeper tomorrow, but at the highest level I look at it is the most vulnerable citizens that we have that have multiple um, chronic conditions. Usually we see that they also have um, mental health or substance use and other as I think of them, social variables, right, or social determinants is usually called to help that really impact their overall health status. So we have a way to evaluate who those individuals are and provide that information to the practices. Puts the 4,000 in perspective, it does. because otherwise it's like. <laughs> right, that's not a lot of people. It's not a lot of people. Thank you for. But it, in the context, but you have to have some context. It is about, I think, 15, 15 to 16 percent of those individuals that are very high and high risk individuals, but we get you those nominations as well. We've talked a lot about enhancing primary care. We have a special program that started off as a pilot called the Comprehensive Payment Reform Pilot. And that's really um, allowing the independent primary care to receive a capitated payment um, so that it can be more predictable and sustainable. It's also enhanced to be able to cover certain care coordination services. We, um, Dr. Joe Haddock, I don't know if he's in this slide deck, he might be in tomorrow's slide deck. It's really said this has been the one reform that has really worked for his particular practice and that embedding, he's embedded a mental health person in his office to be able to see patients. And we don't limit it to say you can only see an ACO attributed life, that's a resource that's available for the entire practice to be able to leverage. And so having that access is, quick access is really important because you know you've been in the doctor's office and they've been like, yeah, here's the number to the nutritional counselor, the mental health, give them a call, and then what happens? Ready access to the office. One of the things that you've heard me talk about is really sustaining that patient-centered medical home and community health team funding to the Medicare program. This year, that's roughly $8.4 million. Um, Medicare only allows this because of the risk arrangement that the ACO is willing to take. So that this money is part of our overall target. So if we don't make that target, um, the ACO is essentially funded those programs. So they're able to continue because of the work that we've, we've decided to, to do together. Data is a big piece of it. We'll talk tomorrow more about some of the data and technology that we have. And one of the things I talked about earlier is really measuring the percentage of high and very high risk, those vulnerable populations. Are they really seeing their primary care physician or practitioner and are they engaged? And we're seeing an overall 6% increase in those populations, which is, is very promising indeed. And I can't remember who asked 
the questions, but really like moving towards those what I'll call smarter care decisions and making some investments in prevention. So in order for providers to do that, they have to make sure that really the system that we're building is predictable and sustainable and they have to feel that um, before they start pouring additional funds into prevention work. But we have seen in the hospitals have um, dedicated some significant funding. It's close, it's over $30 million this year to provide additional investments in things like um, community mental health, um, the home health agencies, Rise Vermont program, which we'll be hearing about tomorrow. And hopefully Representative Rogers should receive the information that we sent him yesterday. And um, also doing things like eliminating those prior authorizations. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the value-based payments because I think um, my colleague Tom Boris will spend some time with you on that. I wanted to bring up because we um, had received a lot of feedback about our transparency, and so what I wanted to do was share with you some steps that we either had in place or put in place uh, currently, and to talk to you a little bit about some of the additional steps that we're pursuing as we move forward. If you didn't know, all of our board meetings are open to the public. We have a public portion of our meetings, um, as well as an executive portion as well. So when we talk about things like contract negotiations, obviously that can't be done in the in public domain. We have put out on our website, we had, um, and sorry, Tom, don't twitch when I talk about this. We had uh, Price Water Hoover's PwC conducted an audit of our financials for 2017 and 2018. This was um, a longer than expected process because looking at an ACO financials is very different than looking at a hospital's financials and to be able to apply those general accounting principles to that um, took some time, but we are happy with the results and uh, we are in full compliance and are looking to put in some processes and procedures to move us to best in class as we, as we move forward. There is a new website, I think I sent it out to folks prior to the session, we tried to put on it quick links to commonly asked questions about one care, like what are your quality results, what are your shared savings? There's a lot of information out there on the Green Mountain Care Board site, and sometimes I think it's a, too much information, right? And there's certain things that you want to have access to. So we try to just put those um, on there, but it's certainly, as you read and think about things, if there's other things that you're like, wow, it would be really nice if we knew this, we'll, we'll add that to the page. And then the last thing is the Green Mountain Care Board does have all of our both budget and certification documents on that website that you could go to and, and find out about things that One Care is actively doing. The other thing that we have talked to Secretary Smith about in order to you know, further the transparency discussion is to explore applying to the IRS uh, for a 501c3 um, nonprofit tax exemption status for One Care Vermont. We would be the first ACO in the country to be able to receive that um, tax exemption status, is what I, I am told. And we think that we have a a good chance at being able to do that because the work is really in the, the spirit of the state's commitment to the LIRA ACO model. And that is something that we've talked about that's very unique to Vermont. So we would need a letter of support um, from the state as we apply for that, that process. So stay, stay tuned on that. And what we've said, if there's certain things under the 990s that we want to know in the interim, we'll be happy to post those those things on our website as well. And then the other big thing that we're working with the Green Mountain Care Board on is key performance dashboards to be able to put on our website. So if you're interested in how we're doing on certain indicators, we can move through that. I don't want to spend too much time on challenges, but um, I just want you to know that they exist. 
<laughs> I'm going to try not to say that it's complicated or that it's hard, but it is both of those things. <laughs> and a lot of the things that we see is that tension of having hospitals and health systems that are still operating a little bit in the value-based system and a lot in the fee-for-service and we haven't quite hit that tipping point. And so they're having to operate essentially two business, two business models. So what we've heard from communities is, um, can we go faster on this and can we get to the value-based system? Because we believe that is what is going to work, but we're not quite moving fast enough. So I think that's one of our challenges, how to move fast enough that it doesn't create too much um, disruption in the process. This is new for everyone. Uh, 2019, um, I'm glad it's behind us. It was a lovely year in many ways, and they're challenging in others. It is uh, operational challenges with both the data and the value-based payments. I think it's first a lot that CMS has had a really tough time administrating um, this, this payment for us, and we had a lot of duplicate payments that were made and incorrect reconciliations that we had to work through. And that uh, makes it hard for providers to really feel like this is predictable and sustainable because they feel like it was anything but predictable or felt sustainable to them. But we, CMS has been, and CMMI has been a very good partner in this and we feel like we're on the right track. They've uh, dedicated additional resources and vendors to this. And remember, we're one of two ACOs that they actually have to administer this type of payment to, so it's not the core business. Uh, the magnitude of risk exposure, we talked a lot about that. It's fairly significant, especially in Medicare. The expanding investments as uh, the population grows, so what is the right dollar amount to be able to invest out into community agencies and um, primary care and to what priorities, so I think that is a challenge. We've talked a lot, I think, I've talked to a lot of you over the summer about the, really the lack of healthcare policy and regulatory alignment. We're still very much operating under the fee-for-service regulatory system, and that's challenging in both of the time and pressure because of it, as well as um, reporting complications. So. I think Senator Westman had a comment. I you moved your uh, offering your challenges, but my comment for the challenges is we're moving all this effort away from um, 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 hospital-based spending and in, into primary care. And all of the reports we get yesterday, they come into our committee and talk that we're 70 doctors short, which is if if 1,500 is the number of people that each primary care doctor, that means we're short. Um, primary care doctors for over 100,000 people. And you want to move all the payments into primary care and we don't have the people doing the work and the medical center is only um, graduating six um, doctors a year. And so um, I'm looking at it and I, I, don't, I don't understand how you can't have that as a challenge and how part of your efforts are not there. That's a comment. You're, you're that right. was a comment. Thank no, no. you for pointing that out. That is a really big challenge that, that we all face, I think, as, as Vermonters. So many times. You might want to add that bullet. I, I bullet. <laughs> <laughs> We're very sensitive right to that one in here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so budget. I know you've got a lot of slides to go through, so we'll try to listen and, um, and then focus our questions at, at later on. Great. All right, so budget section. So uh, what I prepared for today uh, is not the full Fremont Care Board budget presentation that has many more slides, but it's all sourced from that particular presentation. So this is the budget we submitted uh, to the Fremont Care Board, our regulators, at the end of last summer. Um, just for transparency, as soon as we submit that, the world starts changing and, and numbers move. But this is that presentation, or sourced from that presentation. And this is my attempt to really show you how I think of One Care Vermont as an organization and it's as an entity. Uh, I think there's a lot of confusion. We talked 
Um, just to set the table a little bit further, we talked earlier about some of the ACO program dynamics, how you set a total cost of care, things like that. This is the other half of One Care Finance, which is how do you make the, the machine work, the machinery work, uh, and this presentation focuses on the latter. All right, so let's start with some really big numbers. Uh, I'm a native Vermonter, so I know sometimes big can be scary, but let's uh, break them down a little bit. Um, the $1.425 billion number uh, was seen in some headlines. That is the total 2020 One Care value based budget. There's really two components to that, though. One is $1.36 billion of existing health care spending. So this is, these are the existing dollars used to care for Vermonters uh, <coughs> under the programs that we, we enter into. They're not new funds that we generate or ask for under our ACO model. They exist in the system. The, the inclusion in the budget means that we, as the provider layer, are now accountable for those dollars. We're accountable for the cost and quality of $1.36 billion of spend. So an increase there doesn't mean healthcare costs are going up. It means the providers are taking accountability for more of the spend. When you take the difference between those, those two large numbers at the top of the page, you have $62 million. That's the one care budget. That has two components uh, within. The first is $43 million of network investment payments. These are payments that one care facilitate to go right to the providers, facing the patients, delivering patient care, all of those payments are, and programs are designed to help us transition into a value-based care paradigm. Next, we have $19 million of operating costs. That's really the cost of one care organization and, and the, the work that happens in Colchester. Even that can be broken down further. It's, it's a little bit too simple to say this is all administrative cost because a lot of that cost, I'll show this later, supports the providers. It's direct provider support that we centrally locate for really economies of scale. We can deliver more value by centrally housing things like analytics or clinical best practice. And we'll see some of that tomorrow when uh, Sarah Berry is in. Yeah. Okay. And then the very uh, last number on the bottom of the page is our gain and loss. That is zero dollars. We build uh, a break-even budget uh, for 2020 and intend to, to operate in that fashion uh, as we move forward. Okay, financial flow. This is a question I get a lot, and it's honestly complex. I'm going to try to walk through it slowly, but please ask me uh, to pause your questions. At the top, there's really two main sources of uh, funds flow from payers through one care down to the provider layer. On the top left, we have our value based healthcare costs. That's the $1.36 billion I spoke of a moment ago. That's really Medicaid, Medicare, Blue Cross. Healthcare dollars, uh, MVP, we have to think about that as well. In the top right, we have healthcare reform investments. That's the 43 million uh, I showed in the previous slide. Those dollars are sourced from different places. We have listed on the page Medicaid, Medicare, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, MVP, hospitals are a big contributor as well. I'll talk about that in a little bit. As we move to the middle layer, there is a split. There are dollars on the left that are paid directly to the delivery system. And by directly, I mean the payer, Medicare, pays a claim directly to that provider. OneCare never touches those dollars, never flows into the OneCare organization. However, we are accountable for that spend. It's part of our overall accountability. Hospitals and those uh, independent primary care participating in the comprehensive pain reform practice um, those are the ones that accept a fixed payment. Everybody else, FQHCs, independent primary care, specialists, independent specialists, home health, the DAs, uh, out of network, some of the, you know, Boston Children's Hospital, all direct payer to provide a fee for service. On the right hand side are the, the funds that flow through one care run, and really the flow through is, is kind of an important term here. But there's two main components to it. There is uh, 472 million, that is hospital fixed payment revenue. So that's a payment reform initiative where we work with the payer to say, turn off the fee-for-service reimbursement and pay us a lump sum instead. We convert that into a fixed payment that every month we distribute to the hospital participants and move them off of a volume-based reimbursement into this lump sum monthly reimbursement model. In addition, we add the $43 million of healthcare reform investments. 
again, designed to help us do well in, in this value-based paradigm. So participants in the network uh, receive a share of the, the 515 million in a couple of different ways. In the bottom left-hand corner, we have the hospital and the CPR practices again. They receive those fixed perspective payments, population management payments, care coordination program payments, and the, the value-based incentive fund is our way to reward uh, high-quality care. Uh, moving to the right, non-attributing practices. <coughs> Basically, primary care attributes. That, that's a general rule. Can you, can you translate the acronym CPR for those who are? Yep, sure. Which I know we've heard many times, but say it again. Comprehensive Payment Reform Thank you. Program. That's that independent primary care moving to a fixed payment. Right. Terrible that's, action. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little tough. Yeah. Well, resuscitating primary care. Right. <laughs> right. That's, that's the idea. Uh, so in the middle, non-attributing practices. That could be a home health agency, a designated agency. Doesn't attribute lives, but is an important player in our care model. Mm -hmm. uh, big, big players in the care coordination program for those who are high and very high risk in our in our network. Many have relationships with home health and, and the designated agencies. And then also play a big part of the quality score. Uh, a number of our quality measures are related to um, post-discharge um, care after somebody's admitted for a mental health or a substance use issue. So the, the DA certainly play a big role in that. And then in the bottom right corner, we have non-hospital tribute practices. That's an independent primary care site. Uh, they receive population health management payments, care coordination payments by business center. Questions? Funds flow is a little complicated, but we'll do that. May I? Yes, sir. Quick. I just, I just want to be clear. Yeah, quick. So the, you could you could be an independent practice and not receive CPR. Correct. Right. Yep, it's a choice. Or you could be an independent practice and receive CPR. And receive, right. right. Correct. All right, I'll just slide 13 years. So this is the full One Care budget summary. So when I think about One Care as a, an entity, I say we have a $62 million budget. And here's how we get here. The top section are, is our revenue streams. Uh, just like any other organization, we try to um, get revenue from different sources. We have payer program investments. So this is when we contract with the Blue Cross, any investments that they uh, supply to us to help us along this path. We have two rows for the delivery system reform, DSR funding. It's broken down into new program designs that we've built into the budget model and continuation of existing programs. So you can just see the difference there. We are trying to grow some programs uh, for our network. The next row, row four, is the hospital fixed payment care coordination allocation. This one is a little bit confusing to be honest, but it is a payment reform where we convert some of the spend that would otherwise be fee-for-service claims into a cash flow that helps us fund the care coordination program. There's no additional cost to the state. It's a conversion of widget fee-for-service-based payment to a lump sum that we use to fund the care coordination program. And that's in partnership with uh, Medicaid. Health information technology investments, this helps support the analytics platform. We can't do our work without robust, high quality data, so that helps support that effort. Other investments, there's a couple of things in this row. Uh, it's actually a lot of deferred money from the prior year hospital money, I can show that in a minute. Blueprint funding, we've talked about that a little bit as well. Uh, it's, at the end of the day, who pays for it is going to depend on our performance in the Medicare program. If we have good performance, that money comes to the state of Vermont through Medicare. If we do not have good performance, ultimately the hospitals have to write checks for that. And then the last row is hospital dues. It's a large number, I want to talk about that in a few moments, but um, in total that equals $62.2 million of income for One Care Vermont. We spend that money uh, in a couple of different ways. The biggest portion is the $43.1 million for uh, the population health management payments. These are the programs that we facilitate that put the dollars right in the pockets of the providers. The $19 million operating costs have broken down to three categories based on the, basically the line of work. There's network support, regulation, and general admin. Network support are those centrally housed functions that aim to really put resources, information resources, best practice resources into the provider community. Honestly, every provider can go out and hire a data analyst. 
we think it's more efficient to house a team of analysts in one care and supply that information to them, align with all of our program design. Same with the clinical support. Uh, the regulation is the time that uh, the one care organization spends with the screen map care board regulation uh, and other government activities. And then general admin is what you think of as ordinary admin. It's gonna be leadership. It's some of your finance and accounting functions to keep the business alive. Insurance expenses, business insurance, and things of that nature. Questions there? All right, I like this slide, and I want to make a few comments as well. This, so I've, I've been in uh, healthcare finance my entire career. Uh, it's a complicated space, when, especially when you receive funds from your state, because a lot of those funds are sourced, uh, maybe from federal uh, backing as well. But when I think about how the $62 million of revenue is sourced, uh, I've broken it down in this manner. The first is ACO contracts with payers. These are dollars that come into one care because we executed a contract with a payer partner. That could be Medicaid, Blue Cross, Medicare. Included in this is the blueprint funding. If one care or another ACO does not contract with Medicare, the $8 million for the blueprint funding doesn't come to the state anymore in the that I'm aware of. So that first row, all those funds are dependent on one care entering a contract with a payer partner. Next, we have federal federal funding with state match. Can, can I ask, does that first line include SASH? SASH is included. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. The next row is federal with state match. I uh, worked with our partners at, at the state at AHS to make sure I have a, a good understanding of the, the different breakdown, and that's complicated space as well. But we receive in this budget model $11.3 million of funding that is really uh, federally matched funding. And the two main buckets within are the DSR, delivery system reform funding that we've spoken about, as well as the health information technology. Both of those are revenue sources that are subject to a federal match. Um, it's not a 50-50 split. Generally, the match for, is um, it varies, but a large portion of it is 50-50. The HIT, the health information technology funding, comes with a very favorable 90-10 match. So that's why it's not more like a 50-50 federal state share of it. The next bucket we have is hospitals. That's a significant number. I've broken it down, 31 million down to a couple different sub buckets. We have our dues for 2020. We have this fixed payment care coordination allocation I spoke of a minute ago where we convert spend, claims spend, into a cash flow to support the care coordination program. It's really the hospitals as the risk-bearing entities who uh, are subject to that conversion. And then I spoke a few minutes ago of the deferred hospital dues. These are funds that we raised in 2019, entered into contracts to spend, but over a, a number of years with providers. It's a longer term demonstration projects. And then last is other, those are miscellaneous arrangements we have. So when you, you look to the pie chart on the right, uh, really shows the breakdown and how dependent we are on the hospitals. Um, to fund the model. Um, the next largest chunk is the ACO contracts with payers, and then certainly an important piece is the federal funding with the state match component. All that federal funding, of course, depended on the state match. The comment um, I'd like to make next is that I was sensing some um, concern for the hospitals that have a lot of risk, and as you see on this slide, have a, a large portion of the funding. I share that concern, to be honest. And really, when the all payer model came out, um, as providers, we looked at the DSR funding that was available and said, great, finally a reform effort that comes with some funding. This isn't easy to do. It takes everybody in healthcare cut their teeth on fever service. The whole system is built on fever service. Getting out of that is really hard. And the DSR funding came with some optimism that we'd have some resources to do it early on. <coughs> because those dollars didn't immediately materialize, and we have some uh, that have been really helpful, the hospitals stepped up to say, we believe in this, we think this is the right path forward, we'll help contribute to the cost of this ACL model, but I, I worry about the financial burden on the backs of the hospitals right now, um, especially in tandem with the risk that they bear. So I'm just, that, that's consistent with the note I was writing to myself here, it's like, why do the hospitals choose to be part of this? And I think we need to ask the hospitals to speak to that mm -hmm. rather than you. 
but I think that I mean it has to do with this, it has to do with this, this, the risk, entering into the risk, etc. And clearly, there's decisions that have been made that this is uh, in their interest long term. This is valuable, and I think it's important for us to actually have the hospital speak to that. I think that's great. I think that's great. Um, <coughs> And I'd be very curious. I have some ideas about answers you might hear. I think you might hear different answers from uh, CEOs than CFOs in some places. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very curious about well. So we get CFOs in as well, right? Right. And I think they generally work for the CEO. <laughs> but, but you're right. <laughs> well. All right, this is a really complicated slide. Um, again, this, this was supplied in our budget submission to the New York Care Board a few months back. The world changes and moves, but this is my aim to explain some of the funding that comes through the state of Vermont to One Care. And then, of course, we use that to facilitate our programs. The top section is a breakdown of delivery system reform. There's a column for the 2019 amount, a column for the 2020 amount, and then the year-to-year -year change. It's a dynamic space. What DSR funded in 2019 isn't always the same as what's anticipated for 2020, and it's still certainly moving in flux. So in 2019, and we sourced this information in partnership with AHS, uh, we had $2.9 million, $3 million of DSR funding that supported a small component of our care coordination model primary prevention um, and rise from mom within, and then part of the health information technology um, uh, revenue. As we move into 2020, we are asking for more support in the care coordination space. We'd like to continue integrating mental health supports into our model, have some revenue uh, built there accordingly. We would like to continue the statewide rollout of primary prevention programs. And then you'll see that health information technology is zero. It's not that we don't uh, want or need those funds. They're just shifted to the, to the next category below. So in total, 2020's budget includes the $7.8 million of delivery system reform. And then way out to the right, we estimated the state contribution to match, essentially, is 3.9 million. As we move down, we have other state investments. Let's call that, that's the, that's the revenue line on our income statement. It comes from the state, but it is federally backed. We have our health information technology grant, that's the 3.5 million, and we use that to support our uh, analytics functions. Because of the favorable match, you'll see the state contribution is 630,000. Next row, the 5.3 million, I've spoken about that, that's the fixed payment conversion. And then in total, you see a $13.1 million number in the healthcare reform investments line and the $3.5 million number in the health information technology line. Uh, those are carved out basically because that's the way it aligns with our financial statements and the way our income uh, statements done. Lots of moving parts, complicated space. Main questions about that piece. Oh, right, and we're, we hear about the different, the match different differential and, and so on from Diva from e and Ina Bacchus, so. Um, this, this is more complicated. Everything here is always more complicated. Yeah, that's what we do. All right, so here's um, this next slide here is, is a more detailed breakdown of how we spend our $62 million budget. I want to focus mostly in the top section. These are the population health management investments. And we've broken them down into a number of categories uh, here, seven categories. and. In 2019, uh, we, there were about 570 Medicare ACOs across the country, and I bet if you surveyed them, the first three rows would show up just about every ACO budget. I think just about every ACO has some sort of a care coordination program, recognizing the need to better coordinate care across the provider types. Again, to Vicki's point earlier, within a medical record, you know the services that you provide to the patient. You don't know what somebody else has provided to them without an ACO in place to really share that information. So the care coordination, I think, is a very common initiative amongst ACOs. Next, we have our primary care layer. These are the investments we make in primary care. Again, common in the ACO model, which are built around primary care to put resources in that layer to, to drive success. 
And then the last of the standardized uh, initiatives is a quality program. With total cost of care accountability, you have to make sure that you don't have any uh, recession in quality. We are a quality state uh, relative to the, to the nation, and we want to make sure we stay that way. So we put significant resources uh, behind the quality initiative to make sure that we, we remain a high quality delivery system. Can I, quick question. Did, am I correct in understanding that the blueprint expenses are in that primary care line? They're or uh, are down, down, down oh, below. Oh, sorry. Uh, yep, I see it. Yep. Thank you. And those may go to primary care practices, but in terms of the initiative, I've shown here, I'll show the next who receives these funds. So the next row of primary prevention, that's the Rise Vermont component. This is the piece that goes right out to the networks where they uh, may be, for example, hiring a Rise Vermont project manager for the community, and these are the financial resources we supply the community to, to put that position in place. We do have the specialty care row here to uh, pick up on some of the comments before, there's some mental health funding as well as the specialty care program that we're really trying to roll out and advance in this next year. Innovation, we as a diverse and broad network, we get lots of great ideas. And the idea to put some financial resources behind those ideas was one that uh, was met with a lot of optimism. There's a process by which um, the network providers can submit a proposal to One Care and a very thorough review uh, with criteria that Sarah Barry can speak to in much more detail. Uh, much more detailed manner than I can to select the initiatives that we think will help us succeed and can be scaled to other communities. Quick question on the innovation projects. Uh, are you looking for those that are, will sustain themselves rather than having an ongoing investment? That's absolutely a component. Measurability, the ability to say, did this have the positive results is another key uh, component. And then last, you see the blueprint programs. Just note that the number has moved a little bit in, in a favorable way, but this was the number included in the budget submission. And then the, the expenses, uh, we'll go over those again for the sake of time, but those are the three different categories. And you can see in the pie chart to the right of our budget, almost 70% flows right out to the network providers to support their work. So this is a breakdown of the 43 million on slide 17 of who receives these funds? So the pre previous slide showed basically the initiative, care coordination, for example. But what, what provider types are receiving these dollars? At the top of the page, um, and certainly re receiving the, the bulk, are the primary care providers. That large number, $22.7 million of investment in 2020, uh, crosses a number of different programs. You can see that on the right, there's the one care we pay a $3.25 PMPM, big players in the care coordination program, big players in our quality program, um, et cetera. Because they're involved in so many initiatives, which speaks to primary care being really at the epicenter of the ACL model, uh, there's significant funding being invested in that layer. And in general, in terms of the access and capacity, we hope that this is part of a multi prong solution to really bolster the, the primary care capacity <laughs> state of Next, we have specialty and acute care, uh, significant money, again, the specialist program, as well as quality, there's a lot of uh, quality award in the specialty area because it really does affect our overall performance, avoiding things like readmissions, for example. We have uh, supports and services at home, also known as SASH, that's part of the Blueprint program. The designated agencies and mental health providers, 3.4 million, Again, play uh, a role in a number of our initiatives. Community health teams, part of the blueprint. Community investments, so this uh, varied provider types uh, in here, but these are investments going out to different communities to help with their primary prevention work, and Dulce, which is a, uh, a different initiative with the parent and child centers. Home health providers, there's a to be determined here, and that's related to that innovation fund. We don't know who's going to win those um, awards yet, um, but they'll be going to somebody. And then uh, area agencies on aging. And I will note as we built the budget for 2020, we shifted from really capacity building, putting the resources in place, get yourself stabilized with the right resources to pay for engagement. We will pay you when you're actively care managing a patient. And that means that the funding here is really available for the taking, but we're challenging the providers, facing the patient to really engage in this type of work and we're willing to, to help pay for it. Can I ask a question? Sure. 
So a quick question, and then um, what are, are there metrics uh, for uh, looking at uh, changes to premiums, maybe out of pocket and co-pays, as well as for savings with the triple A's? Are you, are you measuring those um, rate of uh, a decreased rate, for example, in in some of the premium costs or um, access to AAA services. Are we seeing that, those changes, are you measuring those changes over time with these investments? Which is a different, a different measurement. I mean, looking at what's going on with a patient expenditure is different from looking at what's going on with the uh, primary care folks, for example. I think the, the answer is... Are yeah. we looking at it, or is that one of the regulatory pieces that might be missing at the level of the board? I don't know. I think it's a very complicated... The answer is yes, but it's a very complicated space. We, when we enter into a program with Blue Cross, for example, we don't affect or change the benefit design. Of course not. Um, but we do believe through two different vehicles that we can help manage the actual health care costs for Vermonters. One is, again, if we avoid an ED visit that might have a copay of $250, again, you know, it all depends on the plan design, or a primary care visit that has a smaller copay, there's savings for somebody. That's complicated too, because if you have 10 primary care visits and you know, one ED, that, then that's complicated as well. But So that's one way. The other way that we try to premiums is through our program design with a commercial payer like Blue Cross. By having the 50-50 sharing of shared savings, the aim is that can be reinvested into their rate development model that they submit to the Green Mountain Care Board and lower premiums. And in 2018, the first year of the two-sided risk program with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, we did have a small overrun and owed them money back at the time of seven. You can look at that and say, that's bad. Well, I, I could argue the opposite. That's the providers taking accountability. And when Blue Cross developed their rate filing, that was incorporated into their filing and reduced premiums. That's another way in which this type of model can directly support uh, cost to Vermonters and patients. There's a long way to go. We, we haven't solved that. The cost shift is a real thing in the state. But we do look at it, pay attention to it, and, and really support the efforts that will help alleviate the out-of-pocket costs. Um, when we look at that very long-term goal of reducing the cost of health care to Vermont, not just, not just the internal cost shift, but the whole thing, um, and I, I look back at page 11 and say, okay, value-based care, when we include the investments towards those goals um, and the administration of one care and so forth, 1.4 million if we were remaining with fee for oh, service, billion. billion, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Minor detail. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the existing fee for service system, that same care being provided to Vermonters would cost $1.6 billion. So right now, I mean, it, it looks like a zero at the end, like it's costing the same, but it's actually costing. 62 million more, presumably the hope is that eventually that would be a negative there, not a plus 62, but a negative. Otherwise, we have not reduced health care costs for, for monitors. Am, am I interpreting that correctly? Uh, yes. Conceptually, yes. There's complexity within. Of the 62 million, some of those dollars are not new expenses. They're conversion of funds that happen to flow through one care. But you're absolutely right that some portion of that 62 million is an additional investment right now to help us move into this paradigm. And you know, one of our goals is to make sure that we have enough savings to offset those investments. Uh, well, offset and gain. Otherwise, we don't reduce the overall I, cost I of care. Yeah. That's that 1.4 versus 1.3 billion. Right. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Senator Ingman has a question. So, um, yeah, so I, I also kind of want to get at what I think some of our constituents, you know, concerns are. So of the um, 
of the 19 million in operating expenses, um, four and a half million, um, you say, is general administration. So how, how many um, employees are there of, of one here? The 77 FTEs in the budget. 77 FTEs. Um, because, you know, of course, set, you know, I don't mean to be crass, but salaries, uh, you know, are, are certainly some of the things that we hear about, um, about our, from our constituents. Um, but the other, um, ooh, what was my other point? My other question. Um, oh, the state's portion. That's the other thing that we hear. Is there an easy way to break down, you know, what taxpayers are paying in, in, into, you know, into the, this whole model of your budget? I wouldn't use the word easy, but yes, <laughs> we do have a breakdown of um, all the different programs that we offer, what, which of those have a funding stream associated? Some do, some do not. And basically, the, whatever's left unfunded ends up being hospital news. That's kind of the way our budget works, is we say, here, here are the population of programs we'd like to run. Here are the revenue sources we can get from our payer contracts or maybe the DSR funding, for example. What's left over falls to the hospitals, and um, largely, Administration isn't funding through public dollars, so the hospitals pay the administrative salaries, things like that. Where we do get some funding that might stay at one care, it's for the like the analytics work or the clinical work that supports the providers. So it, just like any organization, you have different revenue streams coming in, different expenses. You can't align them, um, but it, it is a little bit of a complex space. I could just add a little something to that. Um, we could send this to the committee members um, after we leave. We do have, when we think about economies of scale, so this is a centralized function. Absent a centralized function, every provider organization, because remember, value-based payment is here, performance here, would have to build these systems in, in their offices. So when we think about what is the percentage of our operating costs, we've seen a significant de decline over the years. So that really shows, as you get more populations into the program, the overall effect on the operating costs is significantly lower. Um, and we've been measuring that from 2017 to current state. So we'll make sure to get you that as a percentage of the PMPM over the Okay, okay, I appreciate that. I, I, um, but I'm just, like, I'm looking at this. Uh, is this from, do we get this from Ina, these handouts from Ina in the back? This, I think. So, so on this one handout, it says state support is 16.6 .6 million, which is 1.2% of the total 1.424 billion. Is that, I mean, does that make, sense to, to well, use. We, we, um, so we I, may have to I drill may, down into yeah, that because <laughs> there are different match types okay, within yeah, that yes, amount. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, to say, yeah, as, you know, yeah. as Tom said, it, it does get it's not, yeah, it's not in your yeah, thing, no. but this I, is what I'm, we got. I, and I'm, I'm sensitive to time. I know that okay. well, at least our committee needs to be in our committee room for other okay. things, and as does uh, the House uh, committee. And uh, so I'm going to draw to a close here and thank you both thank you. very much. I mean, the, you've been able to answer a lot of our questions, and it is only stimulating more. Right. <laughs> Great, more thinking. Um, so thank you for being here. Well, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Drive safe. <laughs>